Hello there. I am Frank Zindler, the director of the Central Ohio chapter of the Society of Separationists, a nonprofit educational organization devoted to maintaining the wall of separation between state and church. In recent years, there have been many assaults on the wall of separation between state and church, but perhaps one of the most serious and one of the most sustained efforts has been on the part of right-wing fundamentalist religionists who are seeking to impose what they call creation science on the public schools of America. Today's special program, entitled Big Daddy, is brought to you as a public service, and we hope that this program will help, even in a small way, at restoring the public schools of America as the secular institutions which is as required by the Constitution. Who is Big Daddy? Well, this is Big Daddy. Big Daddy is a comic book which was copyright in 1972 by a fellow by the name of Jack T. Chick of Chick Publications, an organization which prints large amounts of religious tracts and a variety of tracts against the theory of evolution. It is hard to underestimate the significance of this little 12-page horror. Since the time of Charles Darwin in 1859, I am unaware of any single little piece of anti-evolution propaganda which has had such widespread distribution as has this little comic book. And even though it has no scientific significance, it has had enormous significance as a piece of propaganda. And so our program today, entitled The Case of Big Daddy, is going to analyze this comic book. Uh, the plot of this comic book, we can summarize very quickly. The scene opens in a biology classroom in some college, and a buffoon of a biology professor is beginning his lecture by asking the class, how many of you believe in evolution? And a thunderous applause comes back. Everybody in the class says, we believe. All except one person, the hero of the story, a Pat Boone type of fellow who is clean cut and all American boy who says he doesn't believe in evolution, he believes in the Bible literally in the Bible. And uh, as the comic book uh, goes on, uh, this student, as you can guess, outfoxes the professor. The student knows more biology than the professor does. He finally convinces the professor that evolution is impossible. The professor quits his job, and the student takes over the class and converts them to fundamentalist Christianity. Copyright regulations prevent us from showing you the entirety of this comic book. I would love to be able to go through it frame by frame and show you exactly what's going on and what kinds of tricks of logic and so on are being used. But we can't do that. Fortunately, however, the fair use provisions of the copyright law uh, do allow us to show you at least a few of the frames uh, for purposes of criticism and comment, and we will do that. One of the first things that I want to show you in this comic book as we analyze it is the use of what in logic is known as an informal fallacy. In this case, the fallacy of ad hominem. The ad hominem fallacy is where instead of attacking your opponent's argument, you attack your opponent. The Ad hominem fallacy comes in two varieties or species, the so-called abusive species where you simply call your opponent a name, and the circumstantial species where you appeal to the special circumstances of your opponent to try to coerce him into concluding the way you believe. The abusive species, that is name calling, uh, in a comic book really takes the form of name drawing instead of name calling. That is, you draw your opponent uh, as uh, something undesirable instead of just calling him uh, a name which would be undesirable. In this first frame, we see just what kind of people it is that believe in evolution. Doesn't this look like the legions of the great unwashed? In the front row, 
we have Susie Sympathizer on the left. You can be sure she's doing things outside of class that God only intended to be done within the bounds of wedlock. Next to her, we have a Timothy Leary-style acid freak. Not only have drugs burned his brain out to the point where he believes in evolution, he's wearing a peacenik, commie, ban-the-bomb pendant, confirming the view that the evolutionists are probably communists trying to subvert both motherhood and apple pie. On the right, we have a black militant of some sort, replete with a necklace of tiger teeth. From his dark glasses, we can tell that he's also a heroin addict, probably. The rest of the class appears to be composed of a variety of dimwits who share an allergy to soap. To draw one's opponent as an immoral freak is no different than calling him an immoral freak. Our creationist hero, on the other hand, is quite clearly modeled after Pat Boone, although in this particular picture, he has used too much eye shadow. He bathes regularly. His hair is what is fitting for a true American man. He is earnest and serious and believes in the Bible. Our typical biology professor, however, is a closed-minded, short-tempered buffoon, as you can see. He's pot-bellied, bald, and wears pince-nez glasses. As you can see from his hands, which are trying to strangle the air, evolutionists are a violent and thoroughly unpleasant lot. Again, we see the ad hominem abusive species fallacy. If we were to call someone a short-tempered, closed-minded slob, it would be no worse than this graphic portrayal. We've seen just now how the abusive species of ad hominem is employed in just a few selected frames from this comic book. Uh, before we go back and look to see how the circumstantial species of ad hominem has been used, we need to think for a moment as to what is the typical reader of this comic book likely uh, to be like? Who is the typical reader supposed to be? In order to understand what his special circumstances might be, in order to then see at what circumstances the author of the comic book uh, is appealing. Well, probably the typical reader of this comic book will be young, probably will be white, probably will be Protestant, lower middle class, and probably at most modest education. Keeping these circumstances in mind, the circumstances of the typical reader, let's now go back through the same three frames and see how the special circumstances are being appealed to. In the case of the class portrait here, we see people who represent everything our reader has been taught to fear. Susie Sympathizer will suggest not only left-wing politics, but sexual promiscuity as well. The unclean acid freak will remind the reader that just one toke on a marijuana cigarette will addict him for life and lead to a life of violent crime. The typical reader can be expected to fear drugs and the drug culture, hence he will be against evolution if druggies are for it. It was a propaganda genius who thought to put a black militant with an Afro hairdo in the front row. We can expect the typical reader to be afraid of blacks who don't stay in their proper place. This frame will appeal to the reader's fear that blacks are trying to take over America and have even infiltrated our colleges. Enlisting the aid of racial prejudice against the theory of evolution is both brilliant and hitting below the belt. The appeal to circumstance in this frame then can be seen in the attempt to associate evolution with everything the typical reader can be expected to fear and distrust. This is simultaneously the fallacy of guilt by association. Re-examining the hero of our book, we see an appeal to the special circumstance that Pat Boone types are greatly admired by people such as we imagine the typical reader to be. The hero is polite, white, clean cut, and brave. Somewhere along with his high school diploma and his Sunday school attendance pins, he has preserved his grandmother's recipe for American apple pie. Our professor, however, is depicted in such a way as to appeal to the circumstance that many of the readers will be suspicious and fearful of higher education and so-called eggheads. There is a deep stream of anti-intellectualism that runs through American society, and many feel that professors are not only absent-minded, they are frauds who are leading America, if not straight to hell, at least to appeasement of the godless commie Russians. One of the first Bible verses our typical reader will have memorized 
almost certainly will have been 1 Corinthians 3.19. Quote, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Unquote. Thus, part of the circumstantial appeal of this frame is to the anti-intellectualism of our hypothetical reader. But we have in this frame also an appeal to another circumstance of the typical reader, the circumstance that he probably thinks, like President Reagan, that the Supreme Court ruled it illegal to pray in school and will believe the text to be correct when, as it reads here, it says, how dare you even mention the word Bible in this school? You know it's unconstitutional. I could have you jailed for that. Of course, the Supreme Court never said any such a thing. What the Supreme Court actually said was that required prayer and Bible reading were not constitutional. These were, in effect, devotional acts. Anybody can pray in school anytime he wants to, and the Bible can be read in a non-devotional manner. It can be studied. Well, even though Mr. Chick, who is the author of Big Daddy, thinks that he himself did not evolve, it is nevertheless quite certain that his little book did evolve, that it has an ancestry. Although, in the comic book, Mr. Chick gives credit to a Mr. Bolton David Heiser for having helped him greatly in the production of the comic book, he really should have given credit to Mr. F. Clark Howell and the editors of Time Life Books from their Nature Library. Uh, it so happens that this book is largely the ancestor of Big Daddy. This book was published in 1965 and then again in 1967. Those are the years of the copyright by Time Incorporated. And it took approximately five or six years for this book to evolve into Big Daddy. And uh, one of the things we will want to do is to see what items in this book show up later on in Big Daddy. One of the things about this book that is kind of interesting is that it comes with a foldout with an evolutionary sequence of primate fossils. And uh, we will examine this a little bit later on uh, to see in detail how many of these items were plagiarized uh, and reappear in Big Daddy. Um, it is kind of amusing that the creationists are always fond of citing the second law of thermodynamics, saying that either evolution cannot occur at all, or because of the second law of thermodynamics, if evolution does occur, that is, if any change occurs, it can only be downhill degeneration. And I must admit that in the evolution of Big Daddy, degeneration is definitely uh, evident. There is a tremendous decline in quality from the ancestral book to the comic book. Before we examine the centerfold in detail to see this, let us look to see what other things from the Time Life book reappear in the pages of Big Daddy. On page eight of the comic book, we have a drawing of a Neanderthal skull cap and a text which reads, here is the first and most famous clue to early man, the Neanderthal skull cap. Modern dating methods show man to be older than Darwin could have imagined. As you can see here, where we have the camera trained on page 17 of Howell's book, we see the same skull cap with the cracks in the same places and everything. The fine print just under the picture reads, the Neanderthal skull cap, and then cleverly left out the phrase, disputed until more complete finds were made. I say cleverly left out because the book gives you the idea that only one Neanderthal has ever been discovered. And then proceeds, it says, the first and most famous clue to early man. So you see that was taken literally uh, from this page in Howell's book. There's another frame in the comic book, which we will not show you, but in this frame, the professor is twiddling in the air what looks like a, a chicken bone or something like that. And uh, the professor says, pieced together by fragmentary fossil evidence, science can show the stages of man's long march from ape-like ancestors to sapiens. In Howell's book, on the very beginning of the foldout that I showed you briefly a moment ago, we read, 
what were the stages of man's long march from ape-like ancestors to sapiens? Beginning at right and progressing across four more pages are milestones of primate and human evolution as scientists know them today, pieced together from the fragmentary fossil evidence. At the bottom of the same frame in the comic book, the professor gloating over these marvelous words, he says, with wonderful names like Propleopithecus, Proconsul, Dryopithecus, to Paranthropus, to Homo erectus, and on and on to modern man. And it is amusing that the same sequence is found in the fold out here. We have Dryopithecus, Proconsul, and so on, on and on to modern man. In the exact same sequence that these words are listed in uh, the comic book. On the right side of your screen, you can see the original pictures of Pliopithecus and Proconsul. On the left, you see the cartoon equivalents, identical to the limit of cartooning capability. We note that Pliopithecus has for some reason become Propleopithecus and misspelled at that in the cartoon. But Proconsul is not altered in any way. In the comic book, the invited inference is that these two comical creatures were ancestors of man. Now, who would want to be descended from anything so silly looking as Propleopithecus? I'm sure our hypothetical reader wouldn't, and unless he read the original book, he would never know that Hull never claimed he had. We read under the picture of Pliopithecus, quote, one of the earliest proto-apes, Pliopithecus had the look of a modern gibbon, although its arms were not as disproportionately long and specialized for swinging through the trees. On the basis of its teeth and skull, it is now classed as an ancestor of the gibbon line. Our reader has been deliberately, it would seem, been misled into thinking that this unlikely form is claimed to be his ancestor. Actually, it was included in the book to show that man is not the only modern primate for whom fossil ancestors have been found. The great apes had ancestors too. The caption under the picture of Proconsul reads, quote, known from numerous fragments adding up to almost complete skeletons, Proconsul is considered to be a very early ape, the ancestor of the chimpanzee and perhaps of the gorilla. A contemporary of Pliopithecus, it is often found with it in the same fossil site, unquote. Although some authorities believe that one of the various species of proconsul may indeed have been among the ancestors of humans, Howell does not claim that here. Whether or not one of the proconsul species might have been our ancestor, most authorities do agree that the modern African apes trace their ancestry back to the genus proconsul. Now, in the comic book, putting these two apes side by side without comment invites the inference not only that they are human ancestors, but that Propleopithecus is believed to have turned into proconsul. Needless to say, no one ever claimed such a thing. On page nine of the comic book, there's another frame which has the professor holding up a portrait of a fossil ape man known as Paranthropus. And the legend under the picture of Paranthropus reads, Paranthropus, about one million years old. And the professor, with his pince-nez glasses and all, is saying very matter-of-factly and ungrammatically, now this small-brained and heavy-jawed may have favored the more lush habitats of eastern and southern Africa. Now, on page 57 of Howell's book, we find this portrait of Paranthropus, which appears to be a mirror reversal of the cartoon picture. We are reminded that the creationists always claim that if anything evolves at all, it can only degenerate. Once again, they prove their claim. Although the comic book version had a grammatical error in it, the ancestral book is grammatically correct. It reads, as perhaps you can see, Paranthropus, small-brained and heavy-jawed, may have favored the more lush habitats of southern and eastern Africa. The inference which we are invited to make from this comic book is that, first of all, Paranthropus was in full gear a million years ago, and that he was one of our ancestors. Now, surely Chick knew, because he 
was on that page lifting sentences for his comic book, Shirley Chick knew that Howell actually pointed out that Paranthropus is not one of our ancestors. He was sort of an evolutionary sideline that became a dead end. And secondly, that Paranthropus became extinct about a million years ago. Well, let's have a look at the foldout uh, from the book of Time Life, uh, the Life Nature Library series. And then let us compare that with the centerfold in the Chick comic. Lack of time forces us to skip some of the early species in Howell's evolutionary series. Let us begin with his figure of Australopithecus. Australopithecus is a very important fossil for understanding human evolution. With a brain no larger than that of a gorilla, but walking erect, it was as beautiful a connecting link as one could hope for to connect apes and humans. Since this represents a very important piece of evidence for human evolution, we will not be surprised to learn that not only does Australopithecus not appear in Chick's lineup, it does not appear anywhere in the entire comic book. I should qualify that statement. Australopithecus does not appear by name in Big Daddy. His picture does show up, however, under the name of Heidelberg Man. The next figure, Paranthropus, we have already discussed with regard to the plagiarism of the heavy-jawed phrase. He too does not appear by name in Chick's lineup, but his picture does appear with the alias of Nebraska Man. The next picture, labeled Advanced Australopithecus, also does not appear by name in Chick's lineup, but his slightly altered image is there with his name changed to Peking Man. Homo erectus, the next figure, also does not appear by name in the Big Daddy lineup, although Peking Man was a variety of Homo erectus. Once again, however, the figure of Homo erectus will reappear in the comic book with his name changed to Piltdown Man. The next three figures, representing early Homo sapiens, Solo Man, and Rhodesian Man, are not used in Big Daddy. The Neanderthal figure, however, the next in line is used, and it is even called Neanderthal man in the comic book. So you see, not all evolutionary transformations between the book and the comic book were degenerative, it would seem. Finally, as we approach the end of the line, we have Cro-Magnon man with his spear and modern man. Both of these figures show up in Chick's lineup, although modern man will have developed a pot belly just to prove once again, we may suppose, that when evolution does take place, things can only go to pot. Now that we've seen the ancestral book from which the comic book Big Daddy evolved, it's time to take a look at the centerfold in the descendant in the comic book Big Daddy to see how the things you've just looked at have changed. The evolutionary lineup begins at the unlikely level of Heidelberg Man. The caption reads, built from a jawbone that was conceded by many to be quite human. The invited inference here is that this is the presumed most ancient fossil human type and that it is, nevertheless, completely human, no evolution having taken place. The picture itself, however, is an exact copy of Howell's illustration of Australopithecus, except that the stone tool has been erased. Before we flash back to look at the ancestor from which this descended, Note the position of the left elbow and the posture of the left leg, with the left foot showing considerable cleavage between the big toe and the other toes. Now, let's flash back to the picture of Australopithecus from which this was plagiarized. Note that the silhouette is identical. The left elbow and the left leg are in postures identical to those in the parent illustration. Heidelberg Man, discovered in 1907, was indeed thought to be quite human and was placed in the same genus, Homo, as modern man. However, it was clearly not a modern man and is now classified with Peking Man and Java Man in the extinct species, Homo erectus. Instead of being the earliest ancestor of man, as its position in Chick's lineup would imply, it is one of the later stages in human evolution. Proceeding to the second figure in Chick's lineup, we find Nebraska Man. This caption reads, scientifically built up from one tooth and later found to be the tooth of an extinct pig. 
As we have already noted, this picture is actually that of Paranthropus in Howell's book, except that a rock has been placed in the left hand. Before flashback to the original, note the position of the right hand, the barely visible curvature of the buttocks, and the left leg and the enormous cleavage between the big toe and the other toes. Here's the original picture in the Time Incorporated publication, exactly the same except for the rock in the left hand. When I first saw this comic book early in the 70s, I had never heard of Nebraska Man, nor had any of my anthropologist friends. It was not to be found in any textbook. It wasn't used by evolutionists to prove anything. It was something dredged up by the creationists. It took me several years to track down the real story of Nebraska Man, and it actually is a rather interesting story. In, the in about 1922, a badly worn molar tooth was discovered in Nebraska, and it was sent to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And a man by the name of Henry Fairfield Osborne studied the thing. He thought it was perhaps a tooth of some sort of an ape, or maybe even a humanoid type of thing. And he published a description of it. Within several months, a, an article appeared in a British tabloid, sort of a, an upper class version of the National Enquirer. And in this article, uh, actually the article wasn't very sensational, but uh, along with this article, there was a panoramic artist's reconstruction of so-called Nebraska Man, a rather fanciful idea of what he might have looked like. On your screen, you can see a portion of this panorama painted by an artist named Forestier. Of the picture, Professor Smith, who wrote the article in the tabloid, wrote, quote, Mr. Forestier has made a remarkable sketch to convey some idea of the possibilities suggested by this discovery. As we know nothing of this creature's form, his reconstruction is merely the expression of an artist's brilliant imaginative genius, unquote. So you see, even the person who wrote the article wasn't making a big to-do about it. Within a few years of the publication of this so-called Nebraska Man paper, uh, the people at the American Museum mounted several other expeditions out to Nebraska. And within a couple years, they amassed quite a pile of material of all kinds of fossil forms. Among the forms that they studied and discovered were a series of teeth of an extinct peccary, or a type of wild pig. And these showed different stages of wear. And lo and behold, they discovered that really the tooth that they had been studying before, which they thought was that of a primate, actually was an extremely worn uh, tooth of a fossil pig. Professor Gregory, who had worked with Professor Osborne on this study, published a retraction in the journal Science, one of the most prestigious journals of science in America, in which he explained the mistake and that the so-called Nebraska man was really a fossil peccary. Far from this being a tremendous setback to evolutionary studies, I find this a rather inspiring story because it shows the honesty inherent in the people who were doing these studies. Science is supposed to be a self-correcting system. We learn by our mistakes and then try not to repeat them. And in this case, honesty took precedence over personal pride. And that's the way science is supposed to be. And we wait to see this from the creationists. <laughs>